Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, you don't need to be expert on anything at all to pontificate about it on radio, uh, as anyone who's ever had the misfortune to hear Moral Maze will know. Um, so uh, there's a, I don't know if any of you like jazz, um, but there's a story that's told um, about, sorry, just myself some water. Um, there's a story that's told about uh, two of the greatest bebop jazz musicians of the 20th century, Miles Davis and John Coltrane. And um, they were playing together. And uh, I'm going to have to censor this story because it's really an after-dinner story. But, um, uh, and they're playing. And um, Coltrane was known for these kind of river of sound. He used to go into these long solos. Uh, and at the end um, uh, of, the, uh, get, uh, the, of, the, of the track they were playing, Miles Davis was clearly kind of not very happy. Uh, with, with this. And Coltrane turned to him and said, look, you know, I'm really sorry. He said, when I get into these solos, these kind of extemporary solos, I just don't know how to get out of them. And Miles Davis looked at him and said, well, you could try taking the effing horn out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm telling you that is because um, I've kind of taken a slightly risky strategy in terms of what I'm going to say to you this morning, which is uh, I am going to be extemporizing slightly. Um, I, I had a notion of what I was going to say. I've just realized I, I keep identifying people in the audience that I know. There's nothing worse, actually, than speaking to people you know, because they know your secrets, they know your inadequacies. They can kind of wink at you occasionally and undermine you. So I'm not going to look at you, Paul, and I'm not going to look at you. No, no, I'm not. Right, I'll look over here. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to extemporize because I, I was going to talk about uh, work primarily because that's one of the th few things I know something about. But I, I want to talk about... Um, change and policy uh, as well, and try and bring those two ideas together at the end. Can you hear me? I seem to be feeding back slightly. Is, uh, yeah, is that right? Good. Okay, so um, let me start by talking about, about work. So I did this report for Theresa May, uh, which reported last year, um, and it was supposed to be, uh, it was billed as uh, uh, an examination of the impact of new forms of work, gig work, Uber, Deliveroo, things like that. Um, but I decided to kind of hijack it quite early on um, because, I, you, you probably don't know, but quite near the Palace of Westminster, there's a graveyard for, uh, un, un, with unmarked graves of buried reviews. And I didn't really want mine to join that great part because there's mo people much more distinguished than me with much bigger budgets than me who've, whose reports are buried there. So I, I, I thought, well, how do I try to make sure that this piece of work doesn't just get kind of bear it. And so I thought, what, in the end, what this piece of work is about is good work. It, you know, we can talk about the particular issues of Uber and Deliveroo and zero-hours workers and agency workers. But in the end, the only reason we're talking about those things is surely because we have some notion in our mind that work should be good. And actually, I've been kind of obsessed by how it is we can talk more about the quality of work for, for decades. And so that I kind of hijacked the report. And so my, my, my report in the end uh, wasn't called the Review of Modern Employment, which is what my commission was. It was called Good Work. That was the name of the, of the report. It tells you something about the bandwidth the government's got, that it issued its response to my report, Good Work, a few months ago. And its response was called Good Work. So... Um, they obviously didn't spend a great deal of time. They could have called it good work too. This time it's personal, I guess, or something like that. But um, uh, So let, I want to talk to you about why I think good work matters and, and, then, and, then, and, and then go back to some of the themes that Jennifer started to, to, to uh, set down at the beginning. So I argued in the report that good work matters for uh, the following reasons. Um, I argued that it matters because the social contract that I grew up into uh, is broken. And that, that social contract was, and it was primarily based on the idea of male breadwinners, but that social contract was the idea that if you worked, you would get better off every, every year and you'd be economically secure. Now, that's no longer an offer we're making people. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, we've gone through the longest period of stagnant living standards since the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, for an awful lot of people, they work and they are not economically uh, secure. The RSA has done a lot of work on economic insecurity. And what's fascinating is economic insecurity goes a long way up the income distribution. So 
the first reason why good work matters is it needs to be part of a new social contract which says to people, even if we cannot guarantee that you'll be better off every year and you'll be economically secure, we should at least guarantee you that your work is fair and decent and that you have, if you want it, scope for fulfilment in your work and development in your work. That should be the foundation for a new social contract. Secondly, and I don't need to labour this point with you, good work matters because bad work is not just bad for the individual, but it's bad for society because people who have bad work are more likely to drop out of work end up receiving benefits rather than paying taxes, end up being one of the reasons why it takes three weeks to see your uh, GP. Uh, the third reason why work, uh, good work matters, which is a slightly more abstract reason, is that there's a kind of disconnect between how we talk about citizens and civil society, where we're always told, politicians tell us, that we should be active and engaged and respected, and to coin a phrase you may remember, take back control. Uh, but we don't really apply the same values consistently at work. Uh, still at work, there's a kind of master and servant view, which is the deal at work is I pay you and you just do what I tell you to do. So I think if we want active, engaged, responsible citizens in civil society, we should want active, engaged, responsible citizens at work as well. The fourth, re the fourth and fifth reasons are reasons which you will identify with because they'll be part of a kind of rhetoric that we hear a great deal about and there's a lot of truth to it, but I think it needs to be unpackaged. So the fourth and fifth reasons were... Firstly, productivity, that good work is part of how it is we address our productivity problem. It's good to hear the statistic that Jennifer shared with you at the outset, but overall our productivity record is pretty miserable in this country. And as I'm sure you know, it takes Germans four days uh, to, uh, to produce what it takes the average British worker five days to produce. And ultimately, economists will tell you, unless we're able to tackle that productivity problem, um, you know, we won't be able to get onto a sustainable economic growth path. And I'm not, the, not just because I'm a kind of soggy liberal that I believe that good work is part of productivity. Hard-headed business leaders, uh, people like Charlie Mayfield, for example, from John Lewis, will argue that at the heart of our productivity problem is poor management, and the heart of poor management is poor people management. So good work is also part of our productivity strategy. And then finally, uh, sorry, I shouldn't use the word finally. I'm only about five minutes into my speech. It gives people a false sense of hope. But um, uh, finally, technology. Uh, so we all know technology is going to change things um, a great deal. Um, but I think it's really important that we change the way in which we talk about, about technology because I think there's a kind of tendency driven by people who are very enthusiastic about technology or who think they can make a lot of money out of technology or who want to sell books about technology to provide a kind of deterministic account of the way in which technology will impact the world. You know, that by next Tuesday will all be algorithms, uh, and uh, by the Tuesday after we'll all be marrying robots. And um, whilst, you know, it, it is a very good way to sell a book, to tell people that 90% of jobs will be gone by next week, you know, it, it isn't probably accurate. And so we, when we think about technology and we think about technological change, which is something we all have to think about and we all have to think about all the time, I, I do think we should we should resist that kind of determinism. Um, and, and for a, a number of reasons, I, I'll go through very quickly. Firstly, the record, our record of predicting the impact of technology is absolutely atrocious. Uh, so since the 19th century, whenever there is, a, there is a, a, a period of rapid technological change, two tribes emerge. The first tribe who say we're all doomed and there will be no jobs and the second tribe who emerged saying this is the path to paradise would we'll all be kind of fishing in the morning, reading Plato in the afternoon and learning a musical instrument in the evening. Uh, and both those groups, the kind of no-job pessimists and the world of leisure optimists have always and every time been totally wrong. Um, and there's no reason to believe they won't be wrong again. So I don't think that um, uh, we should rely very much on those people who predict what technology will do because they, they predict it on the basis of what exists at the moment. And that's, by the way, that's not just true generally, that's true specifically. It's worth thinking about this when we talk about the effect technology will have on health, that even when it comes to specific sectors. So if, you were, if we'd been here uh, 10 years ago, people would have said the music industry was dead. They would have said that uh, pirating and low-cost streaming meant the music industry was dead. What they didn't predict, of course, was that our mobile phones would turn into radios and record collections and that we would not just listen. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when you used to go into a special room in your house to listen to music. You know, I used to say to people, let's, you know, let's go into my bedroom and listen to music. I mean, it was a euphemism, of course, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, uh, 
whereas now, people listen to music all the time. Maybe there's probably several people in this room now listening to music. I can't, I can't say I blame you. But, so music is ubiquitous. And on the other hand, even in our godforsaken country, although climate change does seem to be doing its work at the moment for us, but even in, with our terrible weather, we've gone from having five festivals every summer to having 1,500 festivals every summer. The whole business model has changed. Instead of people going on tour to sell records, they now make music, put it on YouTube in order to sell tickets to their gigs. So the music industry hasn't died. It's just changed radically. So you know, we're very bad at, at, at predicting these things. The second reason why technological determinism is a bad idea, and I won't go into depth into this, is it's just a really, ter it's really terrible politics. You know, what we're seeing around the world at the moment in things like Brexit and Trump is people reacting to a story about globalization which said to them it's unstoppable force, there'll be some losers, you just need to suck it up. There's clever people who know about it, sit back, you have no agency. People don't really like being told that and that's exactly what they're too often told about technology now, that technology is an unstoppable force, there'll be losers, there'll be things you care about like privacy and truth and protecting your children, forget all that stuff and don't worry, there's these clever people in California, they wear jeans, they love their kids, it's all going to be okay. I mean, that's already starting to unravel. So it's just not good politics to tell people that technology is just something that's going to come and affect them and there's nothing they can do about it. And then thirdly, and of course this is the most important thing, in the end, within organizations, the critical factor about technology is the way in which technology interfaces with human beings. That's what really matters. Um, and so when we talk about technology without recognizing the, in, the, the vital importance of the interaction of technology with human beings, with all our kind of foibles and oddities and needs and desires, um, then we, you know, we're, we're going to get it wrong and, we're, and we will do it wrong. You know, anybody who's been through a technological process knows that if you don't embed technological change in your organizational change strategy, then you're unlikely to succeed. I'm, I'm on the board, the independent panel for DeepMind Health, and what Google Deep Mind what interests me about that work really is not so much the technology, which I don't really understand, but the amount of time which they put into things like service design and the engagement of clinicians and the engagement of patients. And that's not just about PR, it's also because they, you know, they have learned that unless you really understand people's kind of day-to-day -day lives and their imperatives and what matters to them, you end up uh, with a technological solution that, that doesn't actually work because it's not built around how people are. So I think when we, when we think about work and we think about technology, the thing that we need to talk about more than we often do is, is a you know, very simple idea, and that's management. We need to talk about the quality of management. I said in my report uh, uh, that the most important determinant of the quality of people's work is the quality of management, which they experience at work. And it's an incredibly simple point, but it's one that's easy, too easy to forget. And so, ending this first part of what I have to say, uh, I, I just want to share with you um, a piece of work done a few years ago, but for various reasons which I can't go into. I think it's very, it, you know, it, it, it captured something which is very powerfully rooted, actually, in human nature, in what motivates us and what drives us. So this is a piece of work undertaken by a friend of mine, a futurist and designer called Charlie Leadbeater. And he, a few years ago, he looked at the most innovative organizations in the world. So at that stage, he looked at Pixar, the animators. He looked at FC Barcelona, the football club. He looked at an amazing kind of Cambridge molecular biology lab that was winning Nobel Prize. He looked at an Indian social enterprise that was bringing affordable education to millions of children in India at low cost. And he looked at all these organizations, and he said, in the end, what is the characteristic? What is the way you would describe these highly innovative organizations? And he came up with a, a, a beautiful phrase, I think not just because it's alliterative, which always helps, but he said, they are, he said they are creative communities with a cause. Creative communities with a cause. And for me, what that means is a particular type of leadership, cause leadership. So that's leadership that is visionary and that is strategic, aimed towards a great goal. Community, a sense of people working together, but not inwardly to defend themselves, but in pursuit of a great objective, you know, making the best cartoons in the world, playing the best football in the world, inventing the best discoveries in the world. So that sense of collective commitment to a transformative goal, and then finally creative. These were organizations that empowered and expected people to show personal responsibility, to make choices, to create spaces in which they could take risks and try things out. Creative communities uh, with a cause. And so that, let me just leave that idea as I move on to the second part of what I want to say, which is the bit that I've kind of decided to talk about because I heard the news this morning. Um, creative communities with the cause. That's 
let's just hold that idea that that might be the best environment in which to give people great work, also the best environment to uh, introduce technology, also the best environment to be highly innovative. So the second thing I want to talk about is policy. So uh, as I was uh, getting ready um, uh, to uh, uh, come this morning, I listened to uh, the, the news, and it's being briefed on the news that the government might be wondering whether or not the Lansley reforms have been entirely successful. Now, uh, you know, I, I, I suspect there are you know, members of as yet undiscovered tribes uh, in the kind of Amazon rainforest who probably know that the Lansley reforms aren't going according to plan. So that wasn't a kind of great shock to any of us, and uh, who knows what that briefing is in pursuit of. But what it put me in mind of is uh, a, a kind of tragic admission I have to make to you, because I am a, a policy wonk. I've spent my life in the world of policy. Um, and, and so just as it's hard for me to admit that my football team, West Bromwich Albion, are crap and will always be crap, it is hard for me to admit to you that policy generally fails. Policy generally fails. So it's not just this particular set of reforms, although one could say that this is a heroic example of failure. Um, policy, generally speaking, fails. It, it, it sometimes fails kind of catastrophically, like the London Underground Public-Private Partnership or the poll tax or whatever. And, but more often, it fails because... It achieves an effect while it's a priority, while there's money going into it. But once the priorities shift and the money goes, things revert to how they were before. So if you measure a policy by this criterion, which is, does it shift the equilibrium? Does it shift the underlying equilibrium of a system? Then I'm afraid, overwhelmingly, policy fails. So I've given quite a lot of thought, because this basically means that my life has been a failure. Um, and so I've reflected a bit on, on, on why this is. Uh, and I think that, you know, there are lots of trivial reasons why policy fails. It fails because of mm, politicians mm, trying to get headlines. It fails because of politicians being frightened of headlines. It fails because of poor quality uh, information, stupidity, etc., etc. But there are two non-trivial reasons, in my view, why policy fails. That is to say, when I say they're non-trivial, I mean they're inherent. They're really, really, really difficult things to avoid. The first is that policy tends to be too scattergun. So policy tends to try to influence one or two or three variables in a complex system rather than understanding the system as a whole. And then what happens is that those interventions don't generate the consequences within the system that one might hope. And uh, sometimes it just means that the, the effect is diffused across the system. And sometimes it actually means that you get a kind of immune response from the system, which means that things are worse after your... Uh, initiative. So that kind of scattergun problem is the first problem. And the second problem is a kind of path dependency. So if you work in government, it's the same, by the way, if you run a strategy in any organization. If you're trying to get permission to drive change, it takes a long time, actually, generally speaking. And by the time you've got that permission, when you then set out on the change process, when inevitably things don't quite work out as you've said, because you've spent months telling people, my plan will work, and then you, it, you start to do it, and it doesn't. And the, you know, Do you want to go back and tell those people that you've been telling for a year that it's going to work, that within a week it's not quite happening? Like, no. What, you, what we tend to do is to go on the journey that Jeff Mulgan once described of moving from evidence-based policymaking to policy-based evidence-making um, as we try to kind of rationalize uh, what we're doing. And so what you see in government, actually, is two different types of this response to this path dependency. In some areas, what you get is, is policy after policy after policy, which, because it doesn't work immediately, just gets abandoned. And other areas, policies which get pursued, even though it's clear they're starting to have all sorts of dysfunctional consequences. So skills policy is an example of the former. You know, initiative after initiative after initiative after initiative, and they all just kind of disappear because none of them actually achieve, ever had a chance of achieving what they were going to achieve, so they just get replaced by another strategy that's got the same problems. Housing is a good example of the reverse problem, which is persisting with things even when it's quite clear that they are generating problematic consequences. So, so we at the RSA have a, a phrase which we use to try to uh, encourage people to think about change, bearing in mind those two problems, that problem of the kind of scattergun nature of interventions and the problem of this kind of path to dependency. Now, it's a bit of jargon, and I apologize for, for using a bit of jargon. Um, 
I was trained as a sociologist, uh, which means if you're trained as a sociologist, one of the things you have to do is to speak in as opaque a language as possible to uh, try to make it impossible for anyone to, to understand you. There's an old joke which is told amongst sociologists, which is what do you get when you cross a sociologist with a member of the mafia? Uh, and the answer is someone who makes you an offer you can't understand. Um, uh, anyway, so the jargon we use uh, is uh, think like a system, act like an entrepreneur. So we encourage people to think about change systemically, to understand the nature of the equilibrium and why it's persisting, to imagine a different equilibrium at the system level, but then to adopt a strategy to change which is as agile and adaptive and experimental and opportunistic as possible. So, for example, when we work with partners, we say, instead of asking the question, what is the change you want to achieve, we ask the question, where is change imminent in the system? Where is it most likely that change might come from? Is it new leadership? Is it technology? Is it a legitimacy issue around the public? You know, as we see with the tragedy of Grenfell Tower, sometimes the possibility of change comes from terrible, tragic sources. It can come from all sorts of different places. So you have to have a highly opportunistic and agile and adaptive way um, of, of thinking about change. So that's my, my, my second thought. So my first thought is that you're, we will get the best out of people. We will be as innovative as we can be uh, if uh, institutions within the NHS, parts of the NHS, are able to approximate to being creative communities with a cause. That's how we'll get the best out of people in all sorts of ways. And secondly that when we think about change, and we are in a world of continuous change, we're always thinking about change. I bet there isn't a single person in the room who isn't involved in at least three change strategies. Then the way we need to think about change as far as possible is to think like a system and act like an entrepreneur. So what, what conclusion, and that, yeah, you can relax now. That, and when I say conclusion, I actually mean conclusion. Um, what conclusion might we draw from that? Well, I think it's simply this, that we, we are, as I understand it, uh, you know, entering into a new period of thinking about NHS policy, a new 10-year plan. The uh, Prime Minister wants to make a big announcement ahead of the 70th anniversary, so we're, we're kind of thinking big again. Um, it, it seems to me, and I'm an outsider, but it seems to me that, that too often the way we think about the NHS is that we think about the inputs on the one hand, and we think about the outputs on the other. So we think about the money that's going in, and people are obsessed by the amount of money that's going in and where that money comes from. And then the outputs, which is the targets or the aspirations or the things we want to achieve. And then we treat what goes on in the middle as a kind of secondary consideration. So it, it, whatever goes on in the middle is what has to go on in the middle, given the inputs that we've got and the outputs that we're demanding. And so that leads to an attitude to what actually happens within the system, which is you know, kind of cavalier, really. It's, well, it, it, it doesn't really matter whether it actually adds up, whether it actually works. It, it's just what we've got to do because the inputs are fixed and the outcomes are fixed, and so, therefore, this stuff has got to go on in the middle. And, you know, what I would encourage uh, policymakers, managers, those people who advise policymakers to do now, if it's possible, is to completely reverse that logic, actually, and to start not with the inputs and with the outputs, but to start with what works within the system? What kind of system does the NHS have to be in order to be able to succeed? And again, I, I, I speak as an outsider, but my experience of talking to people in the NHS is that there are certain kind of elements of the way in which the system works which are kind of really quite contradictory, quite difficult. You know, how do you balance collaboration on the one hand across the system and targets and incentives on the other that in some ways the NHS is too centralised, in other ways it's too... Uh, it's too devolved. Uh, how do you deal with short-term demands whilst recognising that if you actually want to have a kind of demand management strategy, it's a medium and long-term thing? And these are, we just kind of shrug our shoulders in the face of these problems. And I think we mustn't shrug our shoulders. That, that, that we should ask ourselves, how would we need to organise the NHS uh, in order that... Uh, the institutions within the NHS could be creative communities with a cause, that the people who lead those institutions could, could have institutions with that sense of mission, with that sense of shared purpose, giving people within that organisation the scope and the expectation that they take responsibility, that they show aut autonomy. 
And then secondly, how do we organize the kind of ecology of the NHS so that people who are decision makers within that system are able to think systemically and act entrepreneurially? I mean, this idea, think like a system, act like an entrepreneur, it's easy to say. The hard thing is doing it. Most organizations are not set up to think systemically and act entrepreneurially. Indeed, if you wanted, if someone said to you, create an institution as unable to think systemically and act entrepreneurially as you possibly can, you would invent Whitehall. Right? It is that it's been designed to be it, it, for, for not to work, which is one of the reasons why ultimately I think we have to think about you know any NHS strategy has got to be about how it is we devolve power, because I think it's only at the kind of uh, at the more local level, not at the very local level, but at the kind of city city region level that we can think systemically and we can act in that kind of uh, agile way. So so that's all I have to say really. I I, I think that. You know, and I know that in a way I'm speaking to the converted here, talking to a health foundation event. But as we think yet again about the future of the NHS, let's not start at the edges. Let's not start at input and output and then, dis and then as it were, force the system to do whatever it is we've said. Let's start out what a healthy system with people who are able to lead and able to manage and people who enjoy their work. Let's start with... What has to happen for a system to have those qualities? And then from that, we can start to determine how, what is realistic in relation to the inputs that we have and the aspirations uh, that people have for our system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Tour de force as uh, ever. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions while you're thinking about yours, which is more important, because um, we've got some minutes for questions. Um, but perhaps I can start, if you don't mind, on a policy kind of question. So you've been knocking around number 10 for a few years. You know what the Treasury are like. Maybe um, like cat. <laughs> um, you know, if there really is going to be a settlement, um, hopefully decent for the NHS coming up, um, how do you construct a good case for an investable proposition in the kinds of things you were talking about? Um, I um, was in a meeting recently in one of the former perm sex um, at the um, cabinet office was there. And he was saying, well, you just need to show and demonstrate outcomes. If we put money in, we want to show outcomes. So I then started talking about cancer and um, heart, you know, to get our outcomes more comparable to some in other international countries. And I kind of stopped him and said, well, how, what about the generic um, aspects of the system? What about the people? What about the management? What about the infrastructure? Where you can't really tag on a hard outcome to that. And there wasn't really a response to that. And if you look at a lot of the big documents, the NHS plan, for example, a lot of it's about you know, achieving some tangible outcomes in specific areas. And they didn't really attend to the physiology of the system, which is what you're describing. So, uh, so it's a specific question. What kind of arguments can now be mustered uh, to support a really good culture of management, skilled up management, the kind of creative communities that you're talking about? Because without the kind of investment, people here are fagged out doing the day job and no one's cutting them any slack for space, are they? <laughs> So I think I'd try to marshal three, three arguments. Um, uh, the first would be an entirely kind of pragmatic uh, argument, which would be that there is a huge issue about recruitment, retention, and motivation of people in the NHS. And that's partly to do with the stresses and strains of the job. And it's partly actually, particularly when it comes to medics, about the opportunities that exist to do other things, actually, with the training that you've got. And some of the statistics about the number of people who go through their training, uh, medical training, and decide not to become doctors or don't stay to being doctors very long, you know, is, you know, so if, uh, if an important factor in recruiting and retaining and motivating people is the quality of management they experience, you cannot treat that 
as an irrelevance. You know, you can't simply say it doesn't matter if people feel that their jobs are undoable, you know, at any level. It, you know, we have to have a system in which the people in it feel that they can do their jobs or else you're going to carry on losing people and you will tend to carry on losing the most talented people because they're the people who will feel the highest degree of frustration about the fact that they're not able to use their talents effectively. So pragmatically, I'd say that. I'd link that to a second argument, which is to say to the government, look, you know, you're sponsoring an initiative called Be the Business, which is being headed by Charlie Mayfield, and that's a, a big initiative about productivity. And you're going around the country and you're talking to firms about productivity. What is at the center of that? Uh, is it that companies ought to set themselves higher targets? No. What's at the heart of Be the Business is precisely the idea of improving the quality of management, and particularly the quality of people management. So I think I'd say to the government, if that's what you think is true for the economy as a whole, doesn't that need to be true for the public sector? So if you think that product, the, the, the secret to productivity in small and medium-sized enterprises in Lancashire is improving the quality of management, then surely that uh, you should carry that principle forward into how it is you think about public services. And I think we've treated management as a kind of uh, as a kind of as, as a kind of exogenous element of the system for far too long. We've got to recognise its incredible importance. Um, uh, and then thirdly, I think as a strategy, I'd look at those bits of the health service which are thriving despite challenges. You know, and it's a kind of, you know, I could fall flat on my face here because you could do the research and it might contradict what I've said entirely. But I would say, where is it that we have institutions which uh, have demonstrated a capacity to motivate people and do great things and achieve good outcomes? And where is it that we've got systems which have demonstrated the kind of collaboration system-wide collaboration, which really makes a difference. And what, Now, the, the fact is, I'm afraid this is one of the things that Tony Blair, who was my former boss, got wrong. You can't design systems around the behavior of pioneers because you know, there is a standard distribution of talent, right? So you've got to design systems around the kind of, you know, people who are you know, at the average level and enabling the average to move up, right? But nevertheless, you can learn from pioneers. You can learn from pioneers because they're the people who have managed, despite a kind of problematic, dysfunctional system, to carve out effective ways of working. And so going to those examples and seeing what the characteristics are and then saying, OK, well, they've managed to do it because they're heroic. You can't rely on heroism. How can you then create a more conducive environment for, more, for people who, you know, who aren't heroic to be able to do the same thing? Thank you for that. Um, and, and I just wanted to turn to your other, where you started off really, which was about tech. Um, I kind of read recently, someone said, the future of care is um, flat, patient-centered, and digital. Um, um, that's, that's going into the future. And um, healthcare, we know, is probably going to be the area where there's amongst the richest amount of technology that's going to hit us um, quite soon, despite the fact that you, your comments on that we probably over-egg and get rather techno-ecstatic. In your experience, particularly at the RSA, looking at other industries, um, have you come across industries, I'm surely nothing as comparable as the NHS, but they, where they are successfully introducing and diffusing um, technology in a way that doesn't scare off staff or um, inject antibodies to them because of fear about losing jobs? Is there anything that we can learn from? from yeah, I mean, uh, well, uh, so a couple of responses to that, I think. Um, I mean, the first is uh, that one of my favorite examples of organizational form, which is a creative community with a cause, is um, an organization, social care organization in Holland called Bertzorg, which is run started as a team of 12 people 15 years ago, now runs, I think, 75% kind of, of domiciliary care in the Netherlands and has no hierarchy. So the entire organization is based upon self-managing community-based teams. And the head office is like 20 people. And the guy who runs it, Joster Block, who's an old hippie, runs it by sending blogs out every week. And if people think they're good ideas, they do them. If they think they're bad ideas, they ignore them. But yet, Part of the reason Bertzall works, although it's in, based on these kind of hippie values, it's highly decentralized, it's got a model of care, which puts the patient at the center, then the family and carers, then the community, and then sees the health service 
as mobilizing those forces. Yeah? Um, so it's got all these good things, but actually it uses data really powerfully. And the way it uses data is to tell those teams how they're performing. But the, what happens then is the team is then pulling a coach. So the team brings in a coach, and the coach works with the team as a team and says, why is it we're not performing? So it's kind of interesting for me that that example, which I often talk about in other contexts, is kind of you know, idealistic and full of love and creativity, has actually got some quite strong tech at the center of it to enable, empowering people to achieve what they want to achieve, which is great, which is great outcomes. But I think on the technology point, I, I'm, now this is an idea that is, this is a consequence of the conversations I've had recently, and it's something that's really starting to kind of worry me. Now, the, the, what the RSA's work about technology shows is two things. First of all, that we're not taking it up, actually. Um, that there's a lot of hype, but the work we did last year, a report called The Age of Automation, found that most businesses, you know, they're not, they're not aware of AI, robotics, a blockchain. They kind of think um, that... that Anyway, why would you buy it now? Because it'll be cheaper in a year's time. So actually, the problem we've got is lack of, in very often, it's going to lack of take-up. So we can spend our time being kind of like spending our entire time online reading about robots and autonomous vehicles and all this kind of stuff and Elon Musk. But actually, in the real world, generally speaking, we're not actually doing this stuff. But the other point I make is this. So I talked earlier about uh, how we get our predictions wrong. Now, one of the interesting areas we've got our predictions wrong is retail. So probably few sectors have been as affected by technology as retail. Um, you know, the, f the phrase unidentified object in the packing area is one which we wake up in the night screaming, you know. So we, 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 we look at it. You go to a shop now and you, you do it yourself, right? And, and, and uh, Amazon's now, I think, got shops in, in the state. There's nobody, absolutely nobody. You just walk in and, you know, your phone catches what you're, you're buying and stuff. So obviously the consequence of that is going to be there'll be fewer jobs in retail. That's obvious. Actually, there are more jobs in retail. And the reason there are more jobs in retail is because all of you want your stuff delivered today. And so there are more people now working in warehouses and driving around vans, and they have more than made up for the number of people who aren't working on the shop floor. Now, people say, well, that will change because we'll have autonomous vehicles. The problem is they keep crashing and killing people. So who knows when that's going to happen. But the critical point is this. What's actually happened in retail is that technology has led to the possibility of a higher quality service, people getting things today delivered to their door. And what that's led to is more people being job employed and, the, and, the, and, and retail growing. It's just growing in a different form. And it feels to me as though the problem for the NHS, and I only spotted this yesterday, I might be completely wrong, but it's a very good thing that we are getting people to think simultaneously about our kind of industrial strategy on life science and our NHS innovation strategy. But the problem is that the people working on the former, what they're interested in is the fact that health is the biggest business in the world. And I can tell you, businesses in health are not about demand management. They are not about demand management. They are about the identification of new demand and the meeting of new demand. Yet the NHS has fundamentally got to use technology around the management of demand. And you know, I have spoken to a little bit too many people uh, working on health innovation, who when I push them again and again and again and say, this is all great, but how is it going to help us manage demand? They're not actually interested. You know, and Goldman Sachs, you know, and Goldman Sachs, they produced a report about two or three weeks ago. And I mean, you know, because they're Goldman Sachs, they're utterly shameless. And basically what this report said is there are certain health technologies we need to worry about because they could reduce demand, and there's no business model for that. So what we don't want things that cure, you know, we really, really don't want cures for long-term illnesses, because it's going to screw our business model. So I think in this conversation about technology, we have to kind of recognize there's a tension between the kind of entrepreneurs, technologists, life science, industrial strategy people who really want to grow enormous businesses and generate more demand and give us more and more health care, and the fact that the poor old NHS has got to focus quite hard for the foreseeable future on how it is it reduces and manages demand. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Lots of rich um, points there. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, if you could, thank you. If you could just say who you are. And we'll say person over there. We'll take a few questions and then we'll come back to Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Uh, uh, thanks very much for stimulating discussion. Just like to sort of get your views on sustainability. The Health Foundation has put a lot of investment recently on spreading sustainability. Just like your views on the impact of policy and management around 
systemization because you just said about creating systems around the, beha the behavior of pioneers. Well, a lot of pioneers are about initiation of innovation, but one of the biggest challenges is sustaining it. So I just want your views at the moment on, on, on policy and how that affects and uh, impacts as well as management on sustainability. Do you mean spread and scale as well? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, a, a few more questions, yeah? Oh, thanks, um, I really enjoyed that. I'm Robin from the BMJ. Um, uh, you talked a bit about creativity, and I was wondering if we could just touch on that a bit more in terms of the very sort of day-to-day -day work of clinicians. Um, one could possibly argue that historically the practice of medicine was much more of a craft, and now we talk about systems of healthcare. And I wonder whether when we think about actual day-to-day -day creativity in clinicians on the ground, is there a problem there trying to reconcile the loss of potential craft and maybe more working within a system, or is it just a different type of creativity that's required? Thank you. So can I take this to you yeah. before I forget yeah. them? Um, so um, I think sustainability, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to argue for is I think a view which is um, emerged from thinking about innovation quite a lot in the last few years, which is that the model of innovation we used to have was kind of identify some good practice, pick it up and plonk it down everywhere else. And I think people who are interested in innovation particularly in kind of service sectors, human-based systems, are more interested now in understanding the environment which gives rise to continuous innovation and improvement and, and growing that scaling, that environment, rather than picking up particular practices and moving them from one place to another. So I think, for me, the issue of sustainability is really what I was trying to talk about more than anything else, which is how do you create the possibility for organizations to be able to continuously adapt and improve? So let's think about the organizational form that has resilience and adaptability rather than thinking about particular practices, which, as it were, we want to which work in one particular environment and then put a plonk them down others. Because I think that, that model of innovation has, generally speaking, been unsuccessful. I think in relation to the kind of creativity point, I mean, I think that's one of the things that technology can offer. You know, that's the thing that should excite us about technology is, you know, I don't want creativity when it comes to applying, you know, when it comes to kind of analysing a scan, really. If there's one best way of analysing a scan, well, then we should do it. And if AI can do it quickly and can do it effectively, and I think that the evidence we're going to start to see in the next, just the next few weeks, actually, about some of the innovations in relation to that, that's great. You know, I'm all, all for, you know, I'm all, of, all for AI being used as far as possible in areas where there's kind of, you know, there is a very strong knowledge base and there's one best way of doing it. But the other thing we know is that actually technology is really not very good at all at various, at some things which seem to, in the end, rely a lot upon human beings. In, and you know, learning is an interesting example. You know, we talk a lot about technology and health, but actually people even talk about technology and education for, for, for probably even, even longer in a way. And actually what we've learned is that there is something special about the learning process. And actually you want to think about technology, you need to think about how technology works with that unique quality that comes from learning person to person. And I think the model of health we want is one that also recognizes the unique quality of care and of the interaction between you know, people who have expertise and people who are in need. And that is a place where there will always be enormous scope for creativity and thinking about how it is you inspire and in, in empower people to take greater responsibility for their own health. All that kind of human stuff, that's where I want all the creative. So the best use of technology expands the, 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 the area. And it, actually, this is what is happening in other sectors. So you know, if you go back to retail, the people I talk to about retail and the shop floor say, you know, how do we have a future in, in shops given that people buy things everything online? And the answer is to make the experience in the shop much richer. So that people aren't selling stuff, they're, they're saying a conversation, they're an engagement, it's an experience. And you know, I'm not saying the NHS wants to sell experiences, because I think most of us would rather not have that experience, probably. But you know, that, that is a very positive account of technology, that it is liberating people from things which actually machines can do better in order to focus on the things that, for the foreseeable future, humans will do best. Just uh, if I'm allowed to... There's a really good um, Financial Times book of the year last year, which is by Siskind and Siskind about the future of professions. Some of you will have read it. And they have a really good section on what's going to happen to the medical profession in their view, which is indeed 
the shrinking back of the profession into the bespoke craft area for unpredictable, unprotocolized areas of care. But a lot of the other area is, is actually systematized, as you say, and uh, therefore more able to be um, delivered by non-professional, non non-medics. Non which is a, it's a fascinating book. And on the spread point, there's a really nice session this afternoon on um, context and spread, um, drawing lessons from a decade of our portfolio at the foundation on what are the conditions for spread and diffusion. And it, exactly as Matthew says, it's all about context, not about the thing. It's the, about the context in which the thing is being delivered in. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> We've got time for uh, maybe a couple of quick... Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hannah Coffey, Guys in St. Thomas's. Um, I just have a question about your statement, think like a system and act like an entrepreneur. Um, I, that's the vision, isn't it? And I'm just wondering from your experience at the RSA, what was the kind of the next level down in terms of the conditions, perhaps the skills, perhaps the structures that help encourage that? Um, because just that in itself isn't going to get us to where we get to. I'd be interested in your views on that. She's pinning you down. Any more? One more question? Is there one? Okay, maybe we'll... Okay, well, uh, so, two, so two, two responses to that. I mean, the first is that, you know, we have to recognise that organisations... Uh, in, in conversations about the future of work, there is, a, there is a kind of tendency amongst the kind of futurists to say that organisations are dead and we're all going to be freelancers. And I just think that's not true because I think organisations offer us things that really matter to us. Actually, we do want very often to be led uh, or to lead, and we want to be part of teams. And, and, and also, organizations are just quite an efficient way of enabling people to best use their skills and to progress. So, so I think the thing about organizations is that we must always remember that you know, organizations are things that we cannot live with out, but which generate, constantly generate problems, constantly generate challenges. And so what I didn't tell you about the creative communities with the cause, which is that I, I love that idea, but actually the, the theoretical foundations to that idea, what, what that tells you is that those, what, what Charlie talks about, he talks about a creative community with the cause, is he's talking about the right balance of authority, values, and incentives. And the reality is that balancing out authority, values, and incentives is not something you do once with a reorganization and wander away from. It is the day-to-day -day work of management. You know, those systems are, are kind of pushing against each other all the time. If you have a conversation in a kind of your executive team because things aren't going right, there'll be someone who says what we need is a new strategy and stronger rules. There'll be somebody who says we've lost our sense of purpose. We need to engage people in a conversation about our mission and we need to be a team. And there'll be someone who says no, we need to sack the people who are rubbish and give them a bigger salary to the people who are great. You know, so, and you'll always hear those voices. They are always there. And... So running an organization is an act of continuous kind of vigilance, right, uh, getting those things together. But the second thing, I think, that, that, just let me end with this point, because uh, I, I think it's a hard point if you work in a system like the NHS, which is so incredibly challenged at the moment. But nevertheless, I still think it's something that as managers we always have to think of. So um, about... 10, 15 years ago, about 15 years ago, and I'm revealing something deeply personal right now, but I'm about to leave. So um, I, I went on a kind of weird mass cognitive and behavioral therapy session for a slightly cultish outfit. I'm not going to tell you any more, but we were all there because we either wanted to stop doing something we were doing that we shouldn't do, or we wanted to start doing something which we should do that we weren't. Okay, so, it was, you know, people drinking too much or adulterous or they weren't pursuing their goals in life or, you know, whatever it was. So we all, we all felt stuck, right? So we spent two days in there. I wouldn't recommend it. It was horrible, but... Um, <laughs> You're not going to tell us why you went there. <laughs> no, I'm certainly not. Um, anyone who knows my personal history will realise there's a whole number of things to choose from. But um, uh, what was interesting to me about it was at the end, uh, we all had to get up in front of the room, it's been like this, in front of the room and say, what was our story? We, that's what we were working on. We've been working on revealing our inner story. And what everybody said was a version of the reason I am doing this or the reason I'm not doing this is because it's hard being me. Right? That's what was revealed through this kind of searing two-day process. So I'm going to tell all of you, I'm sorry, it's a bit personal, but I'm afraid it's true, that when you 
do things you shouldn't do or don't do things you should, a voice in your head says, I'm allowed to do this because it's really hard being me. That's, I'm afraid that's just a human foible, you know. But the interesting thing for me is it's true of organizations as well. Right? One of the reasons it's the cover-up that kills organizations is that when they do something wrong, instead of admitting to it and learning from it, they say, we can't admit to this because it's hard being us, and so therefore we're going to cover it up. You know, that's the kind of Hillsborough and all these kind of terrible things. It's because at a moment when people could have owned up and taken responsibility, they said, no, but we can't do this because everyone hates us as police officers already, so you know, we need to cover it up. So the point I want to make there is this. I think anyone in any organization who leads it needs to ask themselves, what is the story in that organization? What is the thing that might be mobilized as your excuse for not doing what you ought to do? So in the corporate sector, it is shareholders and competitors. So you talk to corporations, why aren't you, you know, aligning your business model with social responsibility? Well, I can't because of the bloody shareholders' short-termism and because our competitors are even worse than we are. And so you need to say, what is it that is that story about why it's hard to be us, and you have to try to, to attack that story. You have to, as a leader, say, no, that story is not true. It's not an excuse. And if that means changing the way in which you work to overcome that, that's what you have to do. And so what I did at the RSA, because I want to end up with my own heroic story, but you know, what I did at the RSA is when I, when I got to the RSA 12 years ago, um, I went there because I wanted to mobilize fellows. I was, uh, you know, it's a think tank, and I love think tanks, but actually what makes the RSA different is we've got nearly 30,000 fellows. And I wanted to make, we had 27,000 when I started, I wanted to make them agents for change. But what I found was the way that we recruited fellows when I started was to send them letters with fancy notepaper that said, you've been chosen by Prince Philip to receive a minor honor. Now, the basic problem that was it was a lie. So... You know, if we were recruiting people on the basis of kind of pandering to their gullibility and their credibility, you know, their gullibility and their pomposity, it wasn't surprising that we had a lot of fellows. We had great fellows who understood the organization, but we had too many fellows who didn't know what they were joining and were joining for entirely the wrong reasons. And so I said to our fellowship team, this will always be an excuse for we don't engage our fellows, that they don't like us, they don't understand us, you know, so we have to change it. So uh, what I did was I said, we're going to stop saying that. And so we changed all our marketing, and instead of saying to fellows, this is an award for your fo former achievements, we said, this is an invitation to work with us in the future. Right? We lost 10% of our fellowship almost overnight. So we went from 27,000 fellows down to 25, because it turned out quite a lot of people joined because they did want to be able to say that becoming a fellow of the RSA was a sign of their achievements as the deputy bank manager of you know, Midlands Bank in East Grinstead. So uh, my fellowship team came in to see me every month and said, it's gone down again. It's a complete catastrophe. Our business model is going down the tubes. We've now got 29,500 fellows, and it's rising. And every single one of those fellows knows what they're joining. And we no longer have an excuse. So when I say to my research team, every research project we designed at the RSA has got to engage fellows as partners, they can't say to me, yeah, but fellows are kind of really unpleasant people who don't understand the organization and just like wearing chains of office. Because actually we've got a fellowship that completely understands us and shares our values and wants to get involved. So what I'd say, therefore, is that, is that if in your organization you have an implicit story which people mobilize to explain why it is you're not challenging yourself in the way that you should. You need to name that story, and you need to try and address the factors which enable that to continue to hold you back from what you ought to do. Now, I know that sounds pious and idealistic when you're working in the NHS right now, but still as a leader, if you want to be a leader, you have to take that level of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think that's given us a lot of food for thought, set us off on a really good tack for today. Um, it makes me think, actually, as an aside, there's a big st story here. There's probably, we could spend a whole day on the subject of NHS management, and probably it deserves it, I have to say. Um, so that's, that's food for thought for us. And meantime, thank you very much, not just for the tour de force and setting the scene, but also for the tips about how we might get past the Treasury if indeed the government does cough up some money this year. So thank you so much, Matthew. Um, uh, we now have a coffee break and we're back here at 11. So thank you very much. See you in a minute.